Charlotte Mateka, Lillian Goy, Helen Joseph, Reima Musa, and Sophia Williams de Brain. These are iconic women in South Africa, and today's video is going to be about Women's Day in South Africa. How's it guys? Welcome back to the YouTube channel. It's Tish. I hope you guys are well. Today's video is going to be about National Women's Day. I know there's International Women's Day, but there's National Women's Day in South Africa where we celebrate the women of South Africa that marched in 1956 to the Union buildings to protest against the laws and acts at the time against women's rights in South Africa. I will be talking about that. Thank you guys for watching. If you are new here, please like, comment and subscribe. And if you get to the end of the video, please go check out all my social medias. Links are in the description box below and please follow me on my Instagram as well. Thank you and let's get into this. I first want to say a happy Women's Day and to all of the women of South Africa, you guys are powerful and you guys are strong. And I know you guys will get through everything society is throwing at you guys right now. You strike a woman, you strike a rock. And that saying lives a long life. I will be starting off with an Instagram post that will be linked down below in my Instagram in the highlight woman and I will be reading from the government website as well. It will be linked in the description box down below as well. Women's Day marks the anniversary of the Great Women's March of 1956 where women marched to the Union buildings to protest against the carrying of passbooks on the 9th of August 1956, about 20,000 women marched to the Union buildings in Pretoria to protest against legislation aimed at tightening the apartheid government's control over the movement of women of colour in urban areas. On the 9th of August 1956, 20,000 women staged a march on the Union buildings in Pretoria protesting against the proposed amendments to the Urban Areas Act. The ANC then sent Helen Joseph and Bata Mashaba on a tour of the main urban areas, accompanied by Robert Resha of the ANC and Norman Levy of the Congress of Democrats. The plan was to consult the local leaders who would then make arrangements to send delegates to the mass gathering in August. The march's aims were to protest the introduction of the apartheid pass laws for women in 1952, the presentation of a petition to then Prime Minister J.G. Striedom the women arrived by train and other means. They walked to the Union buildings, the centre of the South African government, in small groups of twos and threes. Large groups were banned by the authorities and met at the buildings, gardens and amphitheatre. Leading the march were Lillian Ngoyi, Raima Musa, Helen Joseph, Albertina Sisulu and Sophia Williams de Brain. Representatives of each group in South Africa carried 14,000 petitions for then Prime Minister J.G. Stradom. The Prime Minister was not available being elsewhere so as not to accept the petition from the multicultural group of women so in his place it was accepted by his secretary. They then stood for 30 minutes in silence before singing in Kosisikileli, the Africa and then sang a woman's freedom song called Watinta Abafazi Stradom. Watinta Abafazi Watinta Mpogoru Ufaz Usa Kufai, you strike the woman, you strike a rock, you will be crushed. The petition had been created by the Federation of South African Women and printed by the Indian Youth Congress. On the 9th of August 2000, National Women's Day, a monument was unveiled at the Malipongwe in Bokorduini and the amphitheatre at the Union Buildings in Pretoria to celebrate and commemorate the event of 1956. The final design for the monument starts on the steps of the amphitheatre with the key words of the petition inscribed in the metal on the risers. Climbing the stairs, you trigger a sound message in 11 official languages. You strike the woman, you strike the rock. When you reach the vestibule, there in the centre lies the Mokoro, a small grinding stone atop a larger grinding stone. The stone sits atop a polished circular bronze stone surrounded by a darker bronze octagon plate. The stone symbolizes the woman's labor and the nurturance while the bronze plate represents the earth and the stone they sit upon. I will now be reading the government website's extract. 
The historic march in 1956 was a turning point in the role of women in the struggle for freedom and the society at large. Since that eventful day, women from all walks of life became equal partners in the struggle for a non-racial and a non-sexist South Africa. The march was coordinated by the Federation of South African Women led by four women, Lily Lingoyi, Helen Joseph, Raima Musa and Sophia Williams de Brain. These leaders delivered petitions to then Prime Minister J.G. Stratham's offices in the union buildings. Women throughout the country had put their names to these petitions indicating their anger and frustration at having their freedom of movement restricted by the hated official passes. Women's Month is a tribute not only to the thousands of women who marched on that day in 1956, but also a tribute to the pioneers of women's movements in this country dating back to 1913, when women like Charlotte Mateka led the way in establishing the ANC Women's League and encouraging women to engage in the struggle for freedom. Pioneers include Sissy, Jainab and Amina Ghul, who are amongst the leaders of the National Liberation League and the Non-European Front of the 1930s. The names of Ray Alexandra Simons, Elizabeth Maffey King and Elizabeth Abrahams will always be associated with the struggles of women. In the 1940s, Amina Pahad and Khadija Christopher who were amongst the first volunteers to occupy the site of the 1956 passive resistance campaign on the Umbilo Road in Durban cannot go unnoticed. Women's Month also serves to recall and recognize the work of Dora Tamana, Sequana Bertha Kokwa and Florence Matomela and other stalwarts of the 1950s who led militant women's formation of the rights of workers and the rights of women. There were also the women who formed the Black Stationed who were the first to protest against the disenfranchisement of the coloured voters during the 1950s. The coloured voters who played an important role in the united front of the anti-apartheid forces that developed in the last three decades of apartheid. Government has made significant progress in empowering women in political, public and educational spheres but marginalised of poor women severely compromises progress. I will now be speaking about the iconic women Lily Lingoyi, Helen Joseph, Raima Musa and Sophia Williams de Brain. Starting off with Lily Lingoyi. This is Lily Lingoyi. She was born in Pretoria in 1911 to a family of six children and obtained her primary schooling in Kultnaton. She later enrolled for nurses training course but she eventually took up work as a machinist in a clothing factory where she worked from 1945 to 1956. She joined the Garment Workers Union under Solly Sachs and soon became one of its leaders Impressed by the spirit of the African National Congress volunteers, she joined the ANC during 1950 defiance campaign and was arrested for using facilities in a post office that were reserved for white people. Her energy, her gift was public speaker, won her rapid recognition within a year of joining the ANC. She was elected as president of the ANC's Women's League and the Federation of South African Women and was formed in 1954. She became one of its vice one of its vice presidents and in 1956 she was elected president. In 1955 she travelled Europe as a delegate to a conference called the Women's International Democratic Federation and was invited by socialist delegates to tour Russia, China and other Eastern Bloc countries. She became members of the Transvaal ANC executive from 1955 and in December 1956 she became the first woman ever elected to the ANC National Executive Committee. Ngoi gained wide recognition overseas as a radical opponent of the apartheid together with Dora Tamana she was arrested while trying to board a ship on her way to a conference arrested while trying to board a ship on her way to a conference in Switzerland without a passport she addressed protest meetings against apartheid in a number of world centers including London's Trafalgar Square on the 9th of August 1956, together with Helen Joseph, the Emma Musa and Sophia Teresa Williams, the brain she led the Women's Anti-Pass March to the Union Buildings in Pretoria, one of the largest demonstrations staged in South African history, holding thousands of petitions in one hand. Ngoi was one of the was the one who knocked on the Prime Minister Stratum's door to hand over the petitions. In 19 
In December 1956, Ngohi was arrested for high treason along with 156 leading figures and stood trial until 1961 as one of the accused in the four year long treason trial. While the trial still on the accused out on bail, Ngohi was imprisoned for five months under the 1960s state of emergency she spent of this time in solidarity. Her banning orders lapsed in 1972 but were renewed for a five year period in 1975. During the time, her banning in Goyi's great energies were totally suppressed and she struggled to earn a decent living. Affectionately known as Ma Ngoyi, she suffered a heart trouble and died on the 13th of March 1980 at the age of 69. Next is Helen Joseph. Helen Beatrice May Fennell was born in Eastburn in the United Kingdom in 1905. She grew up in London with her parents and brother Frank. She graduated with a degree in English from the University of London in 1927. In 1955, she was one of the leaders who read out the clauses of the Freedom Charter at Congress of the People. The Women's March on 9th of August 1956 was one of the most memorable moments of her illustrious political career as she was one of the main organizers of the protest. Arrested on a charge of high treason in 1956, Banned in 1957, Helen's life became a long saga of police persecution. She was the first person to be placed under house arrest in 1962. And she survived several assassination attempts, including bullets shot through a bedroom window late at night and a bomb wire to her front gate. Joseph was diagnosed with cancer in 1971 and her banning orders were lifted for a short time before being reinstated for two years in 1980. Joseph passed away on the 25th of December 1992 in Johannesburg. Next is Reema Musa. Reema Musa was born in the Strand, Cape Town on the 14th of October 1922. She attended Trafalgar High School in Cape Town. As a teenager, Reema and her identical twin sister Fatima became politically active after they became aware of the unjust segregationist laws that rule South Africa. In Johannesburg, Reema became involved with the Transvaal Indian Congress and thereafter the African National Congress as the Congress and the ANC had signed a pact for common struggle. In 1955, she played a significant role in the organization of the Congress of People where the Freedom Charter was adopted. In 1956, while pregnant with her daughter Natasha, she helped organize the Women's March under the auspices of the Federation of the South African Women. Together with Helen Joseph, Lily Lingoi and Sophia Williams, Reema spearheaded the historic march to the Union buildings where women handed over petitions against past laws. Reema and her twin sister Fatima always managed to confuse the security branch officer as they could all could easily switch identities in times of harassment. In the 1960s, Reema became listed at a status that she remained in until the unbanding of the African National Congress in 1970, she suffered a heart attack as a result of diabetes and after this her health deteriorated and drastically changed until her death in 1993, a year before independence. Before passing, she, she always made it a point that her children would continue her work for a South African society. Her children have since been active in the ANC and her husband, though old, is also active in the political work. Next is Sophia Teresa Williams de Brain. She was born in 1938 in Village Board, a mixed area that had different nationalities living side by side. She was raised in a home of her grandparents with her older brother and sister when her grandparents died. Her father, Henry Ernest Williams, bought property at number 17 Tumbler Street in Village Board. With his older brother, she started primary school in the Village Board and went on to attend St. Patrick Catholic Catholic High School in North End, Port Elizabeth. When her father joined the army to fight World War II, Sophia's mother, Frances Elizabeth, moved out of the family house with the children to a new housing development specifically built for colored people called Shorda. Sophia attended the local St. James Catholic School where she continued her education. She became founder member of the South African Congress of Trade Unions which is the predecessor of the Congress of South African Trade Union, COSATU, a trade union work interacted with mainstream political movements of the day such as the ANC, the Congress Alliance, Indian Congress and the ANC at the time was grappling with 
issues such as Group Areas Act, Separation Development Act and Bantu Education Act. It was then that the Colored People's Congress was formed. In 1955, Sophia was appointed as a full-time organizer of the Colored People's Congress. In Johannesburg, the African National Congress and the Transvaal Indian Congress had offices in the basement of the Market Theatre and they gave the Coloured People's Congress office space in the same basement. When Coloured Population Act was put forward, Sophia was assigned by the Congress to work with the lawyer Shulmut Muller, an attorney who was, who, whose husband, Mike Muller, was Secretary General of the Textile Workers Union and was already banned. Together they helped to organize the women around past issues with the women such as Helen Joseph, Lily Ngoi, and Reima Musa. At the same time, Sophia was the forefront of the Congress of People in Cliptown. She led Women's March to the Union Buildings in 1956 and is the only surviving leader of the historical event. She currently serves as a Human Resources Manager and Commissioner of Commission of General Equality. She is the member of the National Executive Community of the ANC's Women's League and is a member of the Sarki Bartman Reference Group. I will now touch slightly on Charlotte Matseka, born on the 7th of April 1871 and died the 16th of October 1939. Was a South African religious leader, social and political activist, she was the first black woman to graduate with a university degree in South Africa with a BSc from Wilberforce University, Ohio in 1903 as well as the first black African woman to graduate from an American university. Her legacy is and has been given to the former Johannesburg General Hospital, which is now known as the Shala Matseka Johannesburg Academic Hospital. The South African Navy submarine SAS Charlotte Matseka is named after her. Matseka is often honored as the mother of black freedom in South Africa there is an ANC nursery school named Charlotte Matseka. A statue of her stands in Pretoria's Garden of Remembrance in South Africa. At the event in 2015 dedicated to International Women's Day at the Cliptown's Walter Sisulu Square, the Gauteng Infrastructure Development MEC plans to convert Matseka's home into a museum and interpre interpretation center. German engineers refer to the three South African submarines as heroin class. The submarines were, uh, were named after three powerful South African women namely Solid Matseka, one being one of them, and Queen Majadi G, the next. The ANC also hosts an annual Charlotte Matseka Memorial Lecture. Beatrice Street in Durban was changed to Charlotte Matseka Street in her honor. Maitland Street in Bloemfontein was renamed Charlotte Matseka Street in honor of the contribution to Africa. Shortly after her return to South Africa in 1902, Matseka began her involvement in anti-colonial politics. She, along with two other individuals from the Transvaal, attended an early South African Native National Congress meeting and was one of the few women present. Matseka attended the formal lunch of the South African Native National Congress in Bloemfontein in 1912. Matseka also became an active in movements against past laws during the political activities. During the Bloemfontein anti-pass campaign, Matseka served an impetus toward event protests by organizing women against pass laws. Many of Matseka's concerns were related to social issues as well as one concerned the church. Charlotte wrote about the political as well as social issues that women faced in Isikosa in writing piece in Teli Wabanti. She wrote about these specific issues Due to activity in anti pass laws demonstrations, Mateka was led to founding Bantu Women's League, which later became the African National Congress's Women's League in 1918. And that is it for Charlotte Mateka and all of these women. And that is it for today's video, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Today's video is about Women's Day in South Africa. I hope you guys learned a lot about South Africa's history. Uh, well something about South Africa's history as well as I hope you guys found out about a few new things about the beautiful influential woman that I spoke about please go check out all the links down below that are related to these women and to Women's Day in South Africa as well as please go check out the links to my social media that's also linked down below please drop me a follow on my Instagram why don't you drop a like comment and subscribe on the channel as well as share the video with your friends if you enjoyed it thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one.